James chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, And if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom That he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said you shall not mur- uh, you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but if you murder you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works... Is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, here's a simple text for me to uh, use as my sermon for today. James has at times been uh, uh, misunderstood as a hard nosed legalist. Some have claimed that he elevated works over faith or that he was actually anti Paul. Paul being the faith apostle and James being the good works apostle apostle, and that he didn't think much of faith, but was more into works. Even Martin Luther, I think, was convinced that this book should not even be in the Bible. And uh, we understand his feelings when you read a section like this lectionary passage this morning. I don't think James is uh, trying to undermine Paul at all, actually, or throw, throw cold water on the centrality of faith. I think James is being much more basic and practical than that. I think he was trying to help us have a faith that made a difference. I think he was trying to help us have a faith that wasn't just words. So James had grown tired evidently in his day as he traveled around or whatever they did back then, sat around, uh, people came to visit him. Anyway, he'd become tired of the empty religious talk. And he was trying to help his readers understand what faith was and that it wasn't just words on a page or something we say in the mirror to make us feel better that day. And so I think this text, although it's complicated, I'm not going to unravel everything. There's a lot in here, a lot that'd be fun to sit and talk about for three or four hours. But, you know, I don't, you're going to get hungry after that amount of time. So um, I think it's bet easier to get the heart of it to start at the end. Kind of a Hebrew thing to do. Let's start at the end with the illustration he ends with and then work our way back a little bit. At the end, he gives this illustration. If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you don't supply their bodily needs, what good is that? 
That's an illustration, by the way. James is not trying to guilt you into going out and doing more for the poor today. We might need to do more for the poor. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's not what he gives this illustration for. He's not trying to do that. He's trying to say, give an analogy of the way that faith is empty, can become empty and worthless. A faith, by the way, in the next say, section, he'll say that even the demons have. We may need to uh, do more for the poor, like I said, but the point he's making is saying this. To use the words, be warmed and filled, doesn't help the needy. To use those words doesn't help the needy, so therefore our religious talk doesn't help us. That's his point. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? And that's also another, we have to unpackage that a little bit. He's not talking about heaven here. He's not talking about getting your membership card. The best way to understand this word save would be to substitute the word help. Can this faith help you? Can this faith really do anything for you? Can this faith that's just words on a page really produce anything for you and for others? James is arguing that saying the right words or proclaiming belief in the right religious formulas has no power to make any difference in our lives. It can't free us or help us or deliver us or rescue us. It's just words. James is not promoting more self-effort, so therefore, this is what happened when I was growing up. So therefore, get out there and be a better person. You know, kind of motivated me to buck up. Do better. James isn't promoting more self-effort, no. But he's promoting a way of viewing faith that is connected with the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. He wants to connect faith with the way we see us, ourselves, and the way we view others. He's promoting a faith that is alive with substance and transformation. It's sort of the opposite of try harder. No, 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 don't just take on the project yourself. Don't just, it's not try harder. It's change the way we view the idea of faith. And he asks the question, how can we talk about believing in Jesus or following Jesus and yet let shame still rule the day? How can we do that? Now back to the beginning where he starts. Our favoritism, our showing favoritism that we know that exists in our culture is evidence that shame has continued to rule the day. James argues that our acts of favoritism demonstrate that we believe that the richer you are or the more powerful you are or the more influential that you are equals having more value, which evidences the presence of shame, evidence the presence of a game that we play, which is opposite of the good news that Jesus preached, opposite of unconditional love. Unconditional love means we are all recipients of the same value. That's the whole message of unconditional love. So you proclaim faith in Jesus' unconditional love and then demonstrate in how you interact with yourself and with others that you really don't believe in it at all. You believe that some people are more important than others. Some people do have more value than others. That's what he's saying here. Your debt, your faith, and James, I know that we can sometimes read James, he sounds really mad, you know, kind of angry. <laughs> you know, if you just change the tone of his voice and hear him pleading with his readers rather than being mad at them. Your faith is dead or lifeless because it's not connected to the way you're seeing yourself and the way you're seeing others. 
I love watching the BBC broadcast this week of the first refugees from Syria being welcomed into Germany. Anybody watch that? It's, it's a very interesting uh, little clip that was, uh, that was broadcast. And a whole bunch of Germans were there at the airport giving those who were getting off the, the planes an ovation and applause. A long applause they were coming through, shouting to them, welcome, welcome, we're so glad you're here, and giving them water and giving them food, and kids were passing out candy to the children. It was such a moving uh, picture of, of that moment. How, way to go, Germans, you know? I mean, way to go. They were demonstrating the belief that these refugees even though the BBC writers got all in trouble for calling them immigrants, which they're not, these refugees, they were, they were demonstrating they were as important as anybody standing in the crowd. Just as valuable. They were acting on the belief that, that those that were coming, even though they were tossed out of their country, were valuable, acceptable, worthwhile, and significant. And isn't that what James is saying? There's no way for us, James argues, to be set free to enjoy love for ourselves or others while trapped in the dead world of favoritism and partiality and shame. There's no way to enjoy it. And for James, that was sad. So the good news was not meant to just be spoken correctly. It was meant to be lived. It wasn't meant to just uh, be a nice formula. It was meant to transform the way we see things. Let the good news of God's love for the world become more than just a platitude. Let the good news of God's welcome to all become more than just a, 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 a phrase on a page. Let it affect the way we see ourselves and the way we see and treat others. There's a story I heard some time ago about a a past moderator of the Church of Scotland. And he took a trip with a couple of other church officials to visit some mission outposts in uh, remote parts of Southeast Asia. And they were visiting the home of one of the elders of one of these small villages. And the elder was so honored that these guests had come to visit him and his little village, that upon arrival he got out his favorite pipe and, and, his, and tobacco that he had been saving for such a special, important occasion, and he offered his guests uh, his, his pipe. The church officials quickly passed on it, explaining that they didn't smoke, but the moderator went ahead and took a puff or two from the pipe. After dinner, the elder got out a few glasses and took out a small bottle of very expensive whiskey and poured a little whiskey into the, into the glasses and offered uh, his guests, his distinguished guests, uh, some drink. The two officials again refused the offer, saying that they, they really didn't, didn't drink, uh, but the moderator just downed it. When they, uh, when they finally left the village, the, uh, the church officials began challenging the moderator, asking him, why did, he, why did he do that back there with the whiskey and the tobacco since they don't, you know, they don't traditionally drink or, or smoke, which, to which the moderator responded, well, somebody had to be a Christian back there. James is trying to say something very profound, very powerful. For all the chiding that James gets for being a legalist, he's trying to say there's something deeper than just right thinking. There's something more central than just ethical behavior. There's something more at stake. And that more at stake is the message of the gospel. That's what's at stake. And if we never go any deeper than proper behavior or proper doctrine or accurate speech, we may end up missing it even for ourselves. That's the tragedy. 
If we continue just to operate in the world of competition, of who's a better human in, the feudal, in that feudal battle, if we just continue to operate that way, no one wins. What we're after is the kind of freedom that transforms our experience of living. What we're after is the peace that comes from knowing that we're truly at home with God by His grace and mercy. We're after a living faith that makes a difference for us. I had a coach in baseball one year that was fond of saying to our our team that we were only as good as as our last at bat. You're only as good as your last at bat. I think he meant it to be uh, motivating, but for most of us it fostered a way of playing scared. We need a way of seeing our lives, or, uh, seeing God, a way of seeing others that completely lets us check out of that bean-counting approach to living. Completely check out of, that's, of, of treating ourselves that way or others that way. Of checking out of judging ourselves and others with our last, as good as our last at bat. We need a way of living that sees ourselves and others as God-loved, God-affirmed, God-dignified human beings. A way that works to overcome our shame-bent world of judgment and comparison, sets us free to live, free to love, free to serve. The Southern Catholic writer Walker Percy once wrote, it's possible to get an A in ethics and flunk life. And there's nothing wrong with ethics or theology or doctrine, but we can also get lost sometimes in thinking that that's what Christianity is about or that's what Jesus was about. James is the corrective to that. James is the corrective to that way of thinking. The way of thinking that says that We must try to become a higher quality of human being. He wanted us to see that faith was not just empty words on a page that we signed our name to that got us into the elite club, not just platitudes. Forgiveness of God means I forgive myself for not being perfect, and I forgive others that way too. Believing in God's mercy means I can actually cut myself some slack. And I can cut others some slack too. Believing in God's eternal, unconditional love means I can let go of shame that cripples us. And I can embrace my own value and worth. And I can stand with the downtrodden and the sidelined and the overlooked because they are every bit as much loved and welcomed as the finely dressed or the well-spoken. The reason James says that faith without action is dead is because faith is not just academic or intellectual. Faith's not passing a dead theology exam. Faith is a a living, breathing way of experiencing the world. Someone had to be a Christian back there, the moderator said. Christian. Not a person that signs a document of beliefs or simply agrees to live by a set of moral principles, but someone for whom their faith alters the way they view their own lives and the way they treat others. It is dynamic and transforming, full of life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.